Hello, good day to one and all. This is Ms. A. Krishna Sundar, Assistant Professor, Department of English, KAHM Unity Women's College, Mancheri. Today we would be discussing the background related with the poem to his coy mistress. So we would be touching upon a brief biographical sketch of the poet Andrew Marvel and a few details regarding what metaphysical poetry is. So here is a poet, Andrew Marvel, who was born in the year 1621 and he passed away in the year 1678. A few biographical details regarding the author. Andrew Marvel is an English metaphysical poet. He was born in Yorkshire and he was a son of an English clergyman. He studied at Hull Grammar School and at the age of 13 he joined Trinity College, Cambridge. During his young days, he travelled all over Europe and he could speak many languages, including French, Spanish, Italian and English. He started writing poetry in Greek and Latin during his college days. So one thing which we have to understand here is that during the 16th century, there was a kind of reawakening which happened in association with the Renaissance period. So a number of literary works from Greek and Latin came up and people started using these languages to write literary pieces. So this could have been one reason why Andrew Marvel started writing poetry in these languages. He also remained as a tutor for a very long time to Mary Fairfax. And more than a poet, Marvel during his lifetime was known, was better known as a politician. And Maybe another reason can be the fact that his poems were not very popular at the time when he survived. When you look at the last days or the last phase of his life, we understand that he died in poverty. So he was not recognized as a great poet during the time when he lived. Now many of the great English writers were never recognized as great poets at the time when they lived. Even if you look at the cases of Robert Browning, Keats, Shelley, etc. They were not considered as very great poets at the time when they lived. Now when we analyze the poems of Robert Browning and when we read the biographical sketch of Robert Browning, we get a glimpse to the fact that his wife Elizabeth Barrett Browning had a better career as a poet during the period. But today, standing in 2020, we recognize Robert Browning as one of the greatest poets in English literature. But this kind of an appreciation or an applause was not given to Browning at the time when he lived. Similarly, Marvel was also not considered as a great poet or a literary icon during the time when he lived. So he was better known as a politician and he was also elected as a member of parliament. So you can see some of the figurines and bus statues which had been erected in England, specifically in the farms in the local places of Yorkshire. Now Marvel was also a very great friend of Milton. So coming to the poetic style of Andrew Marvel, he was not very far away from contemporary neoclassical tradition. So neoclassical tradition in fact used bombastic words and a very elegant kind of metaphors in poetry. And religious themes, biblical themes were also incorporated within the poetic style. Now if you look at certain poems by Andrew Marvel, we can still feel this biblical influence. Even in his coy mistress, he has brought in a number of biblical allusions. Another poem, The Garden, written by Andrew Marvel, again is connected with these religious themes. So, his poetic style mainly dealt with metaphysical poetic style.
So what is metaphysical poetry? We shall discuss it in the coming slide. And he discussed ordinary subjects in an extraordinary way. And this is what makes Andrew Marvel very different from the other contemporary poets. Irony and sarcasm, they also were considered as a huge element in the poetic style of Andrew Marvel. So now let us move on to the main idea or the main concept related with the poem, which is metaphysical conceit. So what is this metaphysical poetry? Metaphysical, let us start by splitting the two words. Meta means beyond. So metaphysical means beyond the physical plane, which means beyond the normal things, something that is extraordinary or something which is not completely understood, something beyond our comprehension, something beyond earthly things, something beyond what you see as the physical things around you. And these metaphysical poems were actually free from the previous artificial forms. I'm sure all of you might know about neoclassical age, neoclassical period. And it was during this period that a very artificial style came up. And this artificial style continued till the romantic period when Wordsworth and Coleridge came up with lyrical ballads. So till then, this artificial form was an important part of writing poetry. Now, this term metaphysical was first used by Samuel Johnson in his book, The Lives of Poets, The Lives of the Eminent Poets of English Literature. And it was during this period, late 16th century, a group of poets emerged bringing this metaphysical conceit. So, in short, metaphysical conceit is a very strange imagery. It includes extremely complicated thoughts and they were actually unimaginable kind of combinations. And imagine the time, 16th century, when poetry was dealt in a very artificial way. This kind of a metaphysical conceit created a kind of shock for the audience and maybe that could be another reason why many poems were not popular during the 16th century but they became very popular in the later centuries so they used extremely complicated thoughts and the poems used intellect and wit so some of the major themes related with these metaphysical conceits were man, his emotions, romance, love etc. so they were basically sensual in nature and they used conceits. And some of the great writers of metaphysical poems included John Donne, George Herbert, Richard Crashaw, and Andrew Marvel. This metaphysical poetry slightly started losing its power during the 18th century when romantics came up. But it was again during the 19th century, during the 1920s, through T.S. Eliot's critical essays that metaphysical poetry once again gained momentum. Because T.S. Eliot in many of his essays speaks about the conceits used in metaphysical poetry. Eliot suggested that heterogeneous ideas were yoked together in violence, which means very contradicting kind of terms were brought together and an imagery was created and this was not something which you can see very commonly in English poetry because there are certain archetypal concepts that would be followed by all the poets and this is where a metaphysical poem becomes totally different because a metaphysical poet will be using some extraordinary images to speak about a very ordinary thing something which we know very clearly. A metaphysical poet, on the other hand, also substantiated that any kind of things could be put together with the use of imagery. So this was perfectly a new concept during the period and maybe one of the major reasons why these poems were not very much appreciated and they were appreciated and applauded in the coming centuries. So what is this metaphysical conceit? 
So you can imagine some images appropriate for love. What are the basic images that you can think when you speak about the term love? Now definitely it's a red rose that might come to your mind. Something that is red in color, beautiful garden, beautiful roses, beautiful sky. Sometimes rain is associated with love. Sometimes two birds sitting together on a branch. So these are some of the images that you can connect with love. Because love is something which offers warmth. So now I would like to take you to one single example which will make you understand what a metaphysical conceit is. And this is the compass image by John Donne in his poem. In his poem, A Valediction, John Donne uses the image of a compass to describe the love relationship between the speaker and his lover. So these are the lines, if they be two, they are two, so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth, if the other do. So, I'm sure most of you might have gone through this poem, you might have studied this poem, but still there could be some people for whom the whole concept of metaphysical poetry can be new. So I'm just explaining this a little bit. So here, John Donne is speaking about his relationship with the lover. And he's actually comparing the two lovers with a compass. You know what a compass is. A compass is a part of your geometrical box which you might have taken to the schools during your high school days. So a compass. Two lovers here are being compared to a compass. Now see, can you just imagine two lovers being compared to a compass? That's a very extraordinary kind of comparison, very strange kind of comparison. Because love is something which offers you a lot of warmth. On the other hand, a compass is actually something which is made of a metal. It is cold when you touch it. And you are speaking about love on the other side. And more than that, compass is something similar to a tool. You can actually create harm using the tool. So comparing love which is harmless and a tool which is harmful, that again is really, really weird. But here John Donne says that the two lovers, they are just like the stiff twin compass, which means one leg can be considered as a man and the other leg can be considered as the woman. And what is a compass used for? The main purpose of a compass is to draw a circle, right? Technically. And here, Dunn says that the man who goes out, usually during the 16th century, we cannot imagine a lady going for work or a lady looking after the home. So, a lady was just assigned with the homebound duties, taking care of the household, looking after the children. So, definitely the lady would be sitting at home. So, the one leg which stands firm on the paper, that leg is the lady. And what happens? Technically, how do you use the compass? You press one leg to the paper and you rotate the other leg around this so that the circle is drawn. Now, the rotating leg, that is a man. Because a man travels, a man has to go out. And here, John Dunn says that the lady will stay firm at the home at the same time, the man will circle around and come back. And once the circle is drawn, what happens? What do you do? Once the circle is drawn, you put the two legs together, you close it and you keep it in your geometric box and you close it down. That's what you do normally. So here again, he says, he brings the very same concept and he says, if the lady is firm, the man can complete his mission and come back. But see, the leg which you are putting firm on the paper, if that leg shakes, can you draw the circle in a neat way? You cannot. So, the drawing of the circle by the other leg depends on the firmness of the leg which is placed at the center. So, Dunn indirectly says that it is a woman's loyalty towards the man which brings him back to her. 
So this is something which can be very controversial if it is read by the feminists. Because many feminists argued that this is by a methodical scheme in which a woman is once again placed within the boundaries of home. But you still can't blame John Donne because he talked about this kind of a concept during the 16th century when women were not educated, women were not going out. So definitely there is no point in blaming John Donne, a poet during the 16th century. So that was a time when women never knew what the outside world is. So definitely she is going to stay indoors. So this compass image is a very very famous image in metaphysical poetry. And this one single image will help you to understand what metaphysical poetry and what metaphysical images were actually. And if you analyze this from a different way, this looks very awkward and weird because how can you compare love to a cold metal? But see, even love can be compared to a cold metal because when you look at the explanations given by John Donne, it looks perfectly right. Because this is the right way because once the man goes out, the woman stays loyal to him, the man comes back and once again they are united. And you normally keep them, keep the two legs together when you're going to put it inside the geometric box. So they are united once again after the man completes his journey. So this is one such kind of a conceit used in metaphysical poetry. Now there is another poem by John Donne in which he says that he is again trying to make his lover understand the intensity of his relationship. This is another poem by John Donne and in this poem John Donne says he is actually pleading to his lady to come and involve in a sexual relationship or a physical relationship but the lady is not ready for that. So it has some slight connection or tones uh, being shared with the poem to his coy mistress because it's the same theme which is coming in coy mistress too. So in this poem by John Donne, John Donne tells the lady that there is a flea which is running around and the flea has actually bitten him. The flea has bitten the speaker and the same flea has bitten the lady. And the speaker says that now the blood is already mixed because the same flea which has bitten me has bitten you too. Which means that our blood is already mixed. In such a scenario, why can't we get into a physical relationship because our blood is already mixed. So there is nothing wrong in getting involved with a sexual relationship. This is what he says. So see it's it's a beautiful concept which normally people cannot think about but once it comes in a different way we understand the image we understand the concept and it comes the comparison comes out even more beautifully than the normal kind of comparisons so this is what a metaphysical conceit is so just remember two heterogeneous very different kind of things are put together and compared so this is done only by the metaphysical poets no other group of poets have dared to do this kind of a comparison and this is exactly what gave a shock to the audience of the time but it, but at the same time this is again one thing which really helped the metaphysical poets to become the real different powerful source of inspiration. So moving on to our poem to her coy mistress. There are three stanzas for this poem and the poem actually begins like a syllogistic argument. So I'm just giving you a basic background related to the poem. We'll be discussing the poem in the next slide, in the next class maybe. So the poem has got three different stanzas and the poem takes the form of a syllogistic argument. So what is a syllogistic argument? A syllogistic argument is just like a mathematical problem. You resolve it through different steps. Now if you look at the three stanzas, if you have the poem with you or if you remember the lines, the first stanza starts like this. Had we but world enough and time. That is how the first stanza begins. Had we but world enough means if we had. So if comes here which means that it is a possibility. If, if I were the Prime Minister of India, 
I would have done that. If I were the chief minister of Kerala, I would have done this. So, if is just a possibility. So, the first stanza of the poem begins with this if. Look at the second stanza. The second stanza goes like this. But at my back. But. So, but here pulls you back to reality. So, the second stanza is all about reality and realistic things. Now, come to the last stanza. Therefore, this is how the last stanza begins. Now, remember, when you do mathematical problems, you resolve it through different steps and in the very last step, you write it. Therefore, x is equal to this is the answer. Similarly, the third stanza, he begins by therefore and he gives a solution. So, the entire poem is written just like a syllogistic argument. In the first stanza, the poet gives a number of possibilities using if. In the second stanza, he takes us back to reality, realistic situation, what is the current scenario and therefore the solution for this problem. So, this is how the poem goes. And this is considered as a Cavalier poem which means it includes a lot number of subjects for celebration. And another important theme coming in the poem is Carpe Diem. So, Carpe Diem means seize the day. Enjoy life to the fullest. That is what the term means. We will discuss the term in detail when we start with the poem. And more than that, there are a lot number of religious allusions mentioned within the poem. And apart from all these things, this is a love poem which you can definitely enjoy and it is a poem of seduction. So, these are some of the basic things that you should know when you are going to learn to his coy mistress. We would be discussing the poem in detail in the coming session. So, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your patient listening. If you have any kind of uh, doubts or if you have any kind of queries, you can connect with me through my email ID. So, thank you very much. Thank you.